This is the headland at the southern end of Newport Beach. The photo is dated 1900 to 1910, but for reasons that will become apparent, the true date has to be closer to 1900. Note that the land behind the cliff is fully vegetated, with 100% coverage of native grasses, shrubs and a small copse here. This land has only been lightly grazed by sheep or cattle, if at all. Very likely this scrub has developed since Aboriginal burning practices ceased 100 years prior, at around 1790 when a smallpox epidemic wiped out 50-90% to 90 of Sydney's Aboriginal people. A massive death toll when considered in the context of COVID, which has so far claimed only a small fraction of 1% of Sydney's population. This is Newport Beach, New South Wales in 1912, or rather Farrell's Beach as it was then known. John Farrell owning much of Newport at the time. Farrell's Lagoon is in the foreground. My younger sister drowned in it in 1952, but she was saved, discovered by the bubbles. This lagoon ran far back, its head being at Woolcott Street well on the way toward Newport Hotel. Boats were rowed a considerable distance inland. Newport Oval was then a substantial wetland, fringed by huge cassiarinas along Gladstone Street. Gradually, the wetland was drained and the creek's banks and bottoms were concreted. It became a canal, where boys caught large eels with a length of string and a piece of meat. Now, all we have to remind us are these photos and a concrete stormwater discharge of stunning ugliness on the beach. But these photos reveal another history of cliff instability. Going back to the 1900 photograph, this is about where Newport Pool stands today. To the right, the bottom of the cliff is fringed with sand. But this 1912 photograph is very different. You can clearly see a large, relatively fresh scar on the cliff face, extending from the edge down an estimated 12 metres. This part of the cliff face has collapsed since 1900. The volume of this event was in the order of 50 to 100 cubic metres for a mass of 120 to 250 tonnes. And it looks as though the collapse has also caused a slump, the combined mass being quite possibly in the order of 500 tonnes. Note also that the land behind the cliff is now completely clear of vegetation except for a few trees around the cliff edge. A fence is clearly visible here. This land is now being grazed by introduced animals, cows no doubt, probably goats and possibly sheep too. At the time of the photograph, there'd been no large sea to remove this collapsed material, be it rock, sand or colluvium. Time rolled on, less than six years as it happens, because this photo was taken in 1918 or immediately prior. But here we see that development of Newport has commenced. The sand is now flat following large seas. The outermost colluvium has been completely removed, again by the sea. And the cliff face scar, now weathered, is noticeably less discernible. And on the sloping land behind the cliff, patches of low scrub have grown, probably coastal wattle, but possibly blackberry bush, showing about the amount of growth you'd expect to see over a period of five or six years. We've now established a history of substantial cliff collapse and avalanche in the area of Newport Pool. Of course, there is no pool in these photos, but there was at North Newport, the Gola Headland. In fact, there were two, which begs the question, was the northern rock platform chosen for a pool because of this collapse? It must have been in people's memory. Part of the problem at Newport Pool in 2022 is this. On about the 23rd of February, after a week or so of rain, there was a relatively small but still significant rock collapse from the cliff face. Significant because it dumped around 17 tonnes of material where people placed their towels and belongings while they swim. Large, potentially fatal rocks also fell over 250 square metres of the area where people like to sunbake and children play. This video was taken on February 24. It was published as a four minute video, Newport Rock Pool Cliff Collapse, No One Killed This Time, the intention being to alert people as quickly as possible to a developing and dangerous situation. You may have seen that video. Another part of the problem is this. Much dramatic evidence of sudden landslide is almost as quickly removed by the next time tide. 
it is simply washed away. People are thus blissfully unaware of what has just happened and as a result ignore the high potential of a repeat event. Subsequent close examination of the cliff face around Newport Pool shows high potential for further falls. Higher strata are extremely weathered, weakly bonded and have many vertically oriented ironstone filled cracks. Being of very low competence, this material frets away constantly as gravel sized flakes, small stones and occasional larger rocks. The gravel accumulates on shelves, loading them up for future fracture and collapse or, in the case of driving rain, mudslides that can quickly grow larger as successive lower layers are brought down by those above them. And all the while, the higher, stronger sandstone beds are being not only undercut by these processes, but are being heavily loaded from above by falling scree and even the construction of swimming pools. In fact, a year ago, a very large piece of swimming pool surround, about one and a half metres by 600 millimetres, and sporting steel reinforcement, collapsed in this area to be moved around behind the rock pool by the sea for some weeks before it was ultimately consumed and disappeared. However, on March 8, after heavy constant rain, it's clear that the feature is a slump, mudslide, landslip, call it what you will. The water's now running down onto the sand because the soil above is super saturated. No absorbing at all. The only safe way to get to Newport Pool is along the water's edge at low tide. But if there's a sea or the tide is higher, you have to enter the danger zone. Furthermore, in the last week the sea has stripped away much of the sand to reveal the underlying boulder beach and for many, many people this is simply too difficult to cross. This leaves only the billy goat track at the foot of the cliff, hard up against the 15 metre high pile of colluvium that reposes against the cliff and I've just indicated that parts of it are at high risk of collapse and that collapse has commenced. In fact, the entire mass of material heaped against the cliff could slump, which might bury the entire track and anyone on it. I understand that at one stage, a property owner actually wanted to erect a fence on what they thought was their boundary, because in the area of Newport Pool, the property boundaries were not high watermark boundaries, but were fixed. However, court rulings of fixed, surveyed, right line boundaries, such as those at Newport, are also ambulatory means that any area now below the mean high water mark has automatically reverted to the crown. Technically, this is different to mean high tide mark, which doesn't include wave run up. Presently, the situation is somewhat unclear. Did someone say dog's breakfast? Which begs the question, who does own the beach? To date, most legalities have focused on the question of natural accretion and erosion and who owns or loses land. Lawyers have tied that in knots, so we now have a situation where natural has to mean at an imperceptible and ongoing rate, that is, in millimetres per year, or even per century. This makes no allowance for catastrophic change, like cliff failure, and certainly doesn't sensibly include sea level change. So I go to Newport Beach and sit at the foot of the cliff or on the beach and am squashed by a rock and become a quadriplegic. If I'm trespassing, do I have anyone to sue? If I'm a legal beachgoer, do I sue council or the property owner? If council didn't warn me with a sign, I might have a case. If the property owner didn't do the checks listed on his or her DA or didn't act on any warnings, then I very likely have a case. If there are no checks listed on the DA, what then? And in any case, does the owner's public liability insurance cover the risk? To be sure, the insurers will have thought of it. All you can see is barristers with sharpened quills at 40 paces wanting to bleed everyone dry. He said, she said, it could go on forever. If more evidence is needed, this is a large avalanche that happened some years prior to this 1900 photograph, there being advanced vegetation growing on it, including trees. 
This report was commissioned and formally adopted by Warringah Council in 1985. It identified management issues at Newport Pool, with particular reference to the bluff area where all these slips and avalanches are occurring. The report was re-adopted by the incoming Pitwater Council and formed the basis of its coastal management strategy and the subsequent notification to homeowners and the Council's development control plan. Pitwater Council did place restrictions on the affected lots and did place information on the 149 certificates, but when it tried to do something more concrete about the affected properties, it ran into strong resistance. This document recommended a revetment policy be developed for the southern end of Newport Beach, a revetment being a passive erosion control rather than a seawall, and the covering of the revetment with a vegetated dune. It further recommended development of a setback policy for those southern beachfront properties and extension of the vegetated dune to the dressing shed. It also advocated acquisition of portions of the properties seawards of the bluff, that is the pool area, for public foreshore reserve. From time to time, Pitwater did clear slide material away when notified by pool users, but was unsuccessful in getting the residents to address the problems on their land. Short of acquisition and placing controls on development, councils apparently have limited powers only to address such issues, particularly when homeowners are able to engage engineers who are prepared to say the slope is safe. Such is clearly not the case. I've been greatly assisted in the preparation of this video by three highly qualified and experienced people, experts in geology, geomorphology and coastal engineering, all acknowledge the danger. On the 12th of March this year, one wrote to me, As you can see, a track has been constructed across two of the depositional areas associated with the two recent cliff failures between the chain shed and the pool. The track work, undertaken this morning, goes right past the warning signs against falling rocks that Northern Beaches Council erected just a few days ago. These signs clearly say, stay clear of cliff face. But notice that in each instance, the track construction work has been undertaken between each warning sign and the cliff face. It was most likely undertaken by a person with good intentions, but unaware of the potential hazards between the chain shed and the pool. The other photo shows that people have already gone back to placing their belongings on the shale bench at the location which was subject to the first main cliff failure just recently. In this photo, the person or persons have placed their belongings near the warning sign. One thing is for certain, the cliffs around Newport Rock Pool are a place of maximum change. Immediately behind the pool, the sea is actively attacking the exposed red shale bed that the cliff rests upon, and high seas sweep the rock platform between the pool and the cliff from south to north, clearing the area of fallen rocks, removing evidence of their fall. Take care when you come to this wonderful dynamic place by maximising the distance between you and the cliff. All evidence suggests the pool itself is safe. But when the ephemeral beach is absent, safe access to the pool is only available at low tide across the rock platform or by rock hopping.